Protists are a really diverse group of eukaryotic microorganisms. Historically, protists were treated in the kingdom Protista, which includes mostly unicellular organisms that don't really fit in any of the other kingdoms. But in modern taxonomy, this group is hotly contested. Currently is better regarded as a loose grouping of 30 or 40 disparate phyla with diverse combinations of trophic modes, mechanisms of mobility, cell coverings, and life cycles. Protists really don't have a lot in common besides a relatively simple organization. They can either be unicellular or multicellular, but if they're multicellular, they don't have specialized tissues. The simple cellular organization distinguishes protists from the other eukaryotes, such as fungi, animals, and plants. Protists live in almost any environment that contains liquid water. Many protists, such as algae, are photosynthetic and are vital primary producers in ecosystems, particularly in the oceans part of plankton. Other protists are responsible for a range of serious human diseases such as malaria and sleeping sickness. Even though they're extremely abundant, they have relatively low species diversity, occupying only about 10% of all the eukaryotes. Unlike bacteria and archaea, protists are not monophyletic. They're actually paraphyletic. What does that mean? Well, groups that include all the descendants of the most recent common ancestor are said to be monophyletic. A paraphyletic group is a monophyletic group from which one or more of the clades is excluded or missing to form a separate group. In other words, a group of taxa is said to be paraphyletic if the group consists of all the descendants of a hypothetical closest common ancestor minus one or more of monophyletic groups of descendants. Currently, the term protist is used to refer to unicellular eukaryotes that either exist as independent cells or if they occur in colonies, do not show differentiation in tissues. These terms are not used in current taxonomy and retained really only as a convenient way to refer to these organisms. And the reason is because they do not accurately represent the phylogenetic relationships. And the taxonomy of protist is still changing. Newer classifications attempt to present monophyletic groups based on structure, biochemistry, and genetics. Because the protist as a whole are paraphyletic, such systems often split up or abandon the kingdom idea, instead treating the protist groups as separate lines of eukarya. So in other words, protists shouldn't really be thought of as a single group, rather they are several different groups that share a specific physical trait. They're either independent unicellular cells, or if they exist in colonies, they show no differentiation into tissues. Like bacteria, protists can have detrimental effects on human welfare. In 1845, a famine struck Ireland with a vengeance. It was a period of mass starvation, disease, and immigration. During the famine, approximately one million people died and a million more immigrated from Ireland, causing the island's population to fall between 20 and 25 percent. The cause of the famine was a potato disease commonly known as potato blight. Though blight ravaged potato crops throughout Europe in the 1840s, the impact and human cost in Ireland, where one-third of the population was entirely dependent on the potato for food, was exasperated by a host of political, social, and economic factors. The potato blight was caused not by a bacteria or fungus, but by a protist. Protists are also responsible for inflicting heat flashes, followed by extreme chills and even death, in the tropical jungles across the world. This protist is malaria and malaria has two stages of life. Gametes get picked up by a mosquito and are fertilized, and when a mosquito inserts its mouth parts into another animal, the protist finds its way to the liver cells and reproduces via mitosis. Those cells then explode out of the liver cell, infecting the blood cells, which is then picked up by the mosquito. Algal blooms, also known as red tides, are caused by ocean-dwelling protists. These protists are known as dianoflagellates, Dianoflagellates reproduce like mad in the presence of natural fluctuations of chemicals in the ocean. As a byproduct of their lifestyle, they produce chemicals that are toxins to fish and shellfish. When shellfish, like oysters, are harvested, they retain those chemicals and can poison humans. Global warming is real, and everybody really knows that now. Everyone's really concerned about the deforestation of the world's tropical rainforest, and these are very important carbon fixators. However, the lungs of the earth are microscopic and rarely thought of. 
They are phytoplankton, and they fix over half the world's carbon dioxide. And just like plants on land, they form the base of the food chain of the world's oceans. Phytoplankton are protists that float on the top layer of the ocean and convert light energy from the sun into chemical energy via photosynthesis. This provides the energy for almost all ocean's life forms, from the unicellular herbivores to whales and even the great white shark. The global carbon cycle, phytoplankton are the most important factor. They are the primary carbon sink, converting carbon dioxide into sugar molecules via photosynthesis. In other words, the more carbon dioxide exists in the atmosphere, the more carbon that is available for phytoplankton to convert into sugar. So in this way, phytoplankton populations are likely increasing and helping to mediate global warming. However, these little organisms can only fix so much of the problem. They're not able to keep up with the skyrocketing carbon dioxide levels caused by the use of cars. This is a global map of photosynthesis on Earth. As you can see, its highest concentrations of photosynthesis in the oceans is actually in the Arctic Ocean, followed by a band around the equator. There's a relatively low abundance of phytoplankton in the middle of the oceans. These patterns are caused from global oceanic circulation patterns. These circulations cause major upwellings of nutrients near the poles, causing huge blooms of phytoplankton in these regions. This is why there is such a robust fishery in Alaska, even though it's bloody cold. It's really all about the nutrients, it's not about the temperature. Even though protists are paraphyletic, meaning they don't all have synapomorphic characteristics that bind them together, what they do have in common is that they're all eukaryotes. And the earliest eukaryotes must have been unicellular and had a nucleus and a mitochondrion, because all eukaryotes, for the most part, have a nucleus and a mitochondrion. How did these come to be? Well, let's see. The leading hypothesis to explain the origin of the nuclear envelope is based on the infoldings of plasma membrane. It is thought that the cellular membrane began to fold into itself and at some point separated from the outer cell membrane and came to envelop the chromosomes. This was the primitive nucleus. Two lines of evidence support this hypothesis. Infoldings of the plasma membrane occur in some bacteria today, and second, the nuclear envelope and ER of contemporary eukaryotes are continuous. It is thought that the major advantage of the development of the nucleus was the separation of translation and transcription. In bacteria, translation and transcription can occur simultaneously. In eukaryotes, they developed a specific way to differentiate gene expression so genes could be turned on and off, allowing specific genes to be expressed at a time instead of the entire genome. It is currently thought that the mitochondrion was taken hostage by an early eukaryotic cell over 2 billion years ago. This theory is known as endosymbiosis, which is when one organism of a species lives inside another organism of a different species in a symbiotic relationship. This current theory holds that the earliest eukaryotic cell performed glycolysis in order to generate ATP. This process is known as fermentation and only produces a net of two ATP. It is thought that a single unicellular eukaryotic cell that had a nucleus engulfed a bacterium that has become known as the mitochondrion. And instead of digesting the bacterium for food, the eukaryotic cell retained it. This proved to be one of the most important interactions for the evolution of life on Earth. Why? That eukaryotic cell could take one molecule of sugar and net 32 ATP. They could make 16 times more energy with the same molecule. As good as the Brius gets, it'll never be 16 times more efficient than my 1969 Camaro with a 454 big block and nitrous injection. So what did the mitochondrion get from this relationship? The mitochondrion got two things. First, it got protection. Kind of like the mafia. It's got to pay its fair share to the boss, but you don't have to worry about anybody busting your balls. It also got free access to pyruvate, which is what it needs to produce the energy. No longer did the mitochondrion have to look for it in its environment. It is fed a constant supply of it by the eukaryotic cell. However, what is extraordinarily interesting is that this happened once in a single cell, and it was so successful that all protists, plants, fungi, and animals on Earth stemmed from this single cell. I think that's pretty awesome to think about. 
So you might ask, where's the evidence? Bam! <laughs> There's actually quite a bit of evidence to support this idea. Mitochondria are tiny. In fact, they're exactly the same size as the average bacterium. The strongest evidence is that the mitochondria have their own genome, their own DNA. And in fact, if you sequence the DNA of the mitochondrion and compare it with the taxa from the entire tree of life, the DNA sequence is most closely related to bacteria, not a eukaryote. With their genome, they can even manufacture their own proteins. And they have double membranes. It is thought that when the original eukaryote engulfed the mitochondrion, the membrane of the original eukaryote wrapped up the mitochondrion, kind of like a bag inside another bag. Only one other organelle does that, and it's thought that this organelle was also consumed by a descendant of the evolutionary powerhouse of a eukaryote, and that organelle was the chloroplast. Photosynthesis originated in bacteria. Then the spawn of that crafty eukaryote that engulfed the mitochondrion really outdid itself by repeating the same process with the perfect complement to the mitochondrion, the chloroplast. However, there's one difference. If you look closely at a chloroplast, you'll see that it has not two membranes, but four. One logical explanation is that another eukaryotic cell engulfed the cyanobacterium, but didn't consume it. That eukaryote held that cyanobacterium hostage and made it make sugars for him. Then our original eukaryotic hero came across and engulfed that eukaryote yet didn't consume it. This produced a superorganism, a single cell that could produce carbon-containing molecules, sugar, and could break it down with extraordinary efficiency. And plants were set to take over the world. <laughs> One way protists quote unquote eat is known as phagocytosis. In this process, protists wrap their bodies around a prey and release digestive juices. They then break down their prey into the molecules with which they use to go through cellular respiration. Protists most commonly eat through absorption. This is a form of consumption where nutrients are taken directly from their environment. And this is most common in organisms such as decomposers, which decompose dead organisms, or parasites which live inside organisms and feed off of them. Protists can move in three different ways. The first is known as an amoeboid motion, and it's done by a structure of the cell which is called a pseudopodia. The pseudopodia stretches out and then the entire cell of the protist moves towards it. Protists can also move by flapping a tail-like structure called a flagella and move in that specific direction in sort of a swimming pattern. Protists can also move by flapping little hairs called cilia on their bodies, and this causes them to move in a specific direction with the efficiency of a hovercraft. Of all the eukaryotes on Earth, the ones we think about most often, fungi and animals, only make up one of the seven major lineages of eukaryotes. All the other major lineages have protists each of which has at least one distinctive morphological characteristic. The amoebozoa are a major group of protozoa that include the majority that move by means of internal cytoplasmic flow. Their pseudopodia are characteristically blunt and finger-like, and things that are blunt and finger-like are called lobose. So these have lobose pseudopods, and these include amoeba and slime molds and their primary mode of digestion is phagocytosis. The Rhizaria are a species-rich supergroup of unicellular eukaryotes. They vary considerably in form, but for the most part they are amoeboid with phyllose, reticulose, or microtubule-supported pseudopods. In other words, they're pseudopods that are basically hair-like structures, as you can see in this picture right here. They also are known to lack cell walls and move by an amoeboid motion with these long, slender pseudopodia. Another major kingdom of eukaryotes are known as excavata. The one thing that they share in common with each other is they have an excavated feeding groove, as you can see in the picture right here. Many excavates lack classical mitochondria. These organisms are often referred to as amitochondria, although most, perhaps all, retain mitochondria organelle 
in a greatly modified form. Most excavates have two, four, or more flagella, and many have a conspicuous ventricle feeding groove with a characteristic ultrastructure supported by microtubules, and this is known as its excavated feeding groove. Most euglenids are unicellular. Many have chloroplasts and produce energy through photosynthesis, but others feed through phagocytosis or strictly by diffusion. And some of these euglenas actually have light sensitive eye spot, which causes them to swim towards the light. So imagine a plant with eyes, and that's kind of what a euglena is. Kind of weird, huh? Ah, this is my favorite kingdom, the plants. Plants include red algae, green algae, and land plants. And some are considered protists, like the red algae and the green algae. They're mostly multicellular, Nearly all of them have cell walls made out of cellulose, and they're photosynthetic, and they have no flagella. Another major group is the Aviolota. The most notable characteristic shared amongst this group is the presence of alveoli, and these are sacs that form a continuous layer supporting the membrane. However, that's basically the only thing that they have in common with each other, in that they have a very diverse morphology amongst the organisms within this group. Another group is the Straminopyla, and they're really different actually, but the one thing that they have in common morphologically is that at some stage of their life they have distinctive hollow hairs. The Oomycota are a distinct phylogenetic lineage of fungus-like eukaryotic microorganisms. They are filamentous, microscopic, absorptive organisms that reproduce sexually and asexually. And they include some of the most notorious pathogens of plants causing devastating diseases such as the late blight of potato and sudden oak death. Diatoms are a major group of protists that are known as algae and they're one of the most common types of phytoplankton. Most diatoms are unicellular, although they can exist in colonies in the shape of filaments or ribbons. The main characteristic of a diatom cells is that they are encased within a unique cell wall made of silica. And silica is nothing more than glass. So here we have a unique group of organism that photosynthesizes and has cell walls made out of glass. And the oddball in this group is the brown algae. Interestingly, the brown algae don't really fit monophyletically with the red algae and the green algae and the rest of the plants. They're within this group. And they're photosynthetic and they're typically multicellular. So these are really kind of strange in this group, but they do have distinctive hollow hairs at the early part of their life cycle. 